Great. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lauren Compare. Um, I head stewardship and engagement at Boston Common Asset Management. I'm delighted to be moderating today's session um, and also launching the official um, uh, the official launch of the phase two of the ethical um, digital uh, ethical AI uh, uh, kick. Um, we are really delighted to um, to have a, a distinguished group of speakers here. And I am going to read some of my opening comments. It's just a little bit easier. Um, I think we're really um, all influenced or use AI every day, and uh, whether we know it or not. And uh, ironically, I used the AI bot yesterday um, when I was posting my LinkedIn post um, for today's launch. And what came out of the AI algorithm um, was actually better than what I wrote. Uh, but we also know that um, there are unintended uh, consequences when AI is used um, without guardrails and without, um, without um, ethics grounding it. And um, specifically, we've seen such good that AI can have um, in supporting healthcare delivery, financial inclusion, operational efficiencies. Um, but we've also seen where it has demonstrated exacer um, and exacerbated bias and, and discrimination and really having negative impacts in previous election cycles. As we know, 2024 is a critical year where there's over 50 elections with 2 billion people um, um, electing officials around the world where we know and have already seen misinformation, disinformation, extreme content really going viral, all being, all being leveraged and, and, and uh, lifted um, with the use of AI. We also know, know there's insufficient guardrails and tools in place, especially non-English language. Um, why, do, why do I support and my firm support um, th this initiative in particular? Um, Really, really a, a few uh, reasons. Um, it's data-driven. It leverages the WBA digital inclusion benchmark. The multi-stakeholder approach provides a cohesive and nuanced approach with insights from groups like Women at the Table and other civil society actors. Phase one demonstrated that time-bound specific objectives yield engagement results. Active involvement of all investors in engaging companies on the same set of asks. Of course, committed uh, co-lead investors in the WBA Secretariat, including Fidelity International and Cadrium, a dedicated and talented WBA team, and a truly global collaboration. Uh, I hope you're able to join us in this next phase of work. Moving on to the program, I welcome our distinguished speakers for a truly multi-stakeholder perspective. I know all will reinforce the need to work together to ensure the development and use of AI by all actors at every stage has guardrails and is guard, uh, grounded in ethics. I'm really uh, thrilled uh, to introduce today uh, keynote speakers, Ms. Tara Denham, and Dr. Eileen uh, Donahue. Ms. Denham is the Director General for Human Rights, Freedoms and Inclusion at Global Affairs Canada. Her office leads Canada's foreign policy development on inclusion, democracy and human rights and its digital and cyber uh, security dimensions. And her group has really enabled three successful launches of the digital inclusion benchmark and is supporting today's event. Um, we're really grateful for your support and leadership um, in supporting this work. Dr. Donahue is a special envoy and coordinator for digital freedom in the U.S. State Department's uh, Bureau of Security and Digital Policy. Dr. Donahue previously led the, the Global Digital Policy Incubator at Stanford and served as the first U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Human Rights uh, Council under human rights under, under President Obama. Jan, I yield the floor to you um, to share some opening remarks um, as the digital transformation uh, lead at WBA. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, and again, on behalf of WBA, I also want to extend our gratitude to uh, Global Affairs Canada in particular. Uh, uh, their support has enabled us to launch uh, three successful editions of the Digital Inclusion Benchmark uh, so far, and it's also made today's event a reality. So we're very grateful to uh, to Global Affairs Canada and to everyone who is uh, in attendance today. Um, so we are incredibly excited to enter this new phase of the coalition. Um, it's a it's a milestone that's nearly two years in the making for us. And uh, as uh, many of you know, some features of the AI landscape have really morphed beyond recognition in that time. 
Um, for those who are unfamiliar with this initiative, there is a lot to celebrate, as, as Lauren uh, alluded to, about the last uh, year and a half, which uh, sort of constituted the first phase of the coalition. Uh, our 34 investor members, uh, who are led by Boston Common and Fidelity International, have engaged with dozens of companies in the first phase to help uh, drive up their transparency about AI. Um, and less than three years ago, uh, 33 out of the 200 companies uh, that we assess in our digital inclusion benchmark uh, had published their AI principles. Today, thanks in part to uh, the energy and the efforts of our members, that number stands at 52. Um, meanwhile, uh, women at the table rallied the civil society group of the uh, kick around a joint submission for the UN Global Digital Compact, uh, driving home the importance of meaningful universal connectivity, uh, human rights, and data protection. Um, today, as uh, Lauren also mentioned, there is a strong incentive for tech companies to move fast and break things uh, and to embrace uh, uh, what some would call transparency theater until regulations catch up and kick in. Um, the concentrated power that resides with uh, the corporations that develop AI uh, needs a collective and uh, an effective counterbalance. Um, so uniting investors, civil society groups, researchers, and other allies around a shared goal is critical if we seek to achieve that. Um, on our part, as a benchmarking organization, we hold 2,000 of the world's most uh, powerful companies accountable across the full spectrum of the Sustainable Development Goals. And what that means is that we have to be sensitive to generative AI will affect users, workers, and the environment very differently in San Francisco than it will in Bangalore. Um, in you know places like Kenya and the Philippines, uh, precarious content moderation work is turning into precarious AI annotation work. Um, facial recognition will affect uh, digital natives differently than it will affect uh, those who are perpetually disconnected and uh, those who are marginalized, especially in the countries of the global majority. And within the tech industry itself, social media platforms and telecommunications companies, uh, to, to cite the two examples, are worlds apart in how they use AI. So for all the progress that we may achieve with AI, uh, we risk running into old problems wearing new hats, uh, so to speak. Um, but uh, our digital inclusion benchmark covers companies that uh, run the gamut of the sort of industry spectrum. So we have to zero in on a set of expectations that all technology companies should be able to fulfill. We have to raise the floor, so to speak, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, so in this new phase, uh, the members of the Collective Impact Coalition for Ethical AI will engage companies on not just their AI principles, but on how they are applied, on their impact assessment processes, on the structures that govern AI. Um, but WBA, uh, throughout the course of this new phase, will be fueling the initiative with new data on companies' disclosures that will keep these engagements dynamic. Um, we're delighted to welcome Candrium uh, as uh, a new investor co-lead of the KIC, uh, their pioneering engagement initiative on facial recognition technology, which I think some of you are familiar with, is joining forces with the KIC, uh, which we're also proud uh, to announce today. Uh, and this, we believe, will sharpen our lens and strengthen the bonds in our community writ large. Uh, we're also proud to welcome more than 20 new members to the initiative, with more to come in the next few weeks. And of course, we are continuously inspired by the efforts of the coalition's members and by Boston Common, Asset Management, uh, Fidelity International, and Women at the Table, who are all continuing to co-lead the kick uh, into the future with uh, seemingly boundless energy. Um, so on that note, I want to thank you all again uh, for sharing your time with us today. Appreciate our fantastic speakers once again. And I yield the floor to Tara as our first distinguished keynote speaker. Thanks, Yan, and thanks again for inviting me to participate in uh, in this phase two launch. And congratulations on all of the work over the last couple of years. Um, such a critical part of this ecosystem that we're all existing in. And so, I just wanted to share a few thoughts about where we are in that ecosystem. Uh, just a reflection of some of the conversations that we all participate in and sort of the feeling that we have from those. And I think for myself, uh, for all of us that have been working on issues related to AI for many of years, it seems like we're, we're very well aware of the opportunities and the risks that comes with using artificial intelligence. We see the permeation into our public and private lives, uh, as has already been noted. But I would also say that for myself and for our teams, we do feel that there's a broader recognition 
of the responsibility that comes with deploying these very powerful tools, especially when it comes to uh, the need for human rights respecting governments. When governments and companies get this wrong, it can be catastrophic. I think a lot of the conversations that, that I've heard over the last year is, uh, you know, we saw what happened with the rollout of the web, high hopes, uh, you know, let it, let it bloom and, and let everyone participate. But that wasn't how it rolled out. That wasn't the impact. And in fact, the threats to human rights uh, can be immense. Um, and that's why I think I see that sort of shift, whereas a few years ago, it was trying to get everybody to understand those risks and needing to, to put significant efforts behind it. Um, and now I think it's just the different players in that multi-stakeholder approach really needing to push through and find different ways of working together. Uh, Lauren, you already mentioned it. We're also looking at a year uh, of significant uh, opportunities to vote, over half the population coming uh, with the potential to participate in elections this year. And we know, we're already seeing uh, how those will be impacted and, and how AI will be um, sort of shaping or the potential to shape some of those dynamic conversations. So the need for those safeguards, we're living it. It's not a philosophical conversation. Um, and I think as we're building that ecosystem, it's also pushing the ecosystem at the same time. So maybe just to share a few thoughts on where that ecosystem is. Um, we did see at the Munich Security Conference that there was the Tech Accord to combat deceptive use of AI in 2024 elections that was spearhead, spearheaded by Microsoft. And I believe they had uh, 20 companies sign on. And it does demonstrate that companies are, and, and by the participation here today, companies can lead and are doing work to protect the rights of citizens in this environment. But that also exists within the ecosystem of efforts that governments are undertaking. So we also have the Global Declaration on Information and Integrity Online, which Canada and Netherlands led on, but that we have 34 countries that have signed on. We have the G7 Hiroshima AI process, work that's gone through the Freedom Online Coalition. And there's a lot of other commitments and efforts that are underway to build that ecosystem. And that's where I guess I wanted to reiterate that the ecosystem demonstrate that there's a lot of multi-stakeholder efforts underway um, to sort of tackle these risks. And Canada, uh, obviously we will be taking on the presidency of the G7 in 2025. And we really have to think of where that ecosystem is now. And is why I, I really appreciate the work that's here and the, and the data driven. And where do we have to keep pushing? Where do, in a multi-stakeholder approach, we all have different levers, opportunities, and capabilities, and how are they going to come together to push it forward? Um, and for me, that means that all of the actors in that multi-stakeholder, uh, we really have to push into the implementation of the commitments that have been made. Um, and that is always easier to say than to do. Uh, and that is, at, of course, the core of a lot of the work that's happened here. Um, in the uh, Collective Impact Coalition Progress Report, it does suggest that companies are falling behind on their basic responsibilities under the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. There is an example there that of the companies that have AI principles in place, Few have disclosed that they have conducted human rights impact assessments on the de development and deployment of the technologies. And I think in that, this is where, again, it's the holding to accountability because for the largest players, there really isn't any excuse. There's a lot of guidance out there as to what should, you know, what that can look like. Um, so one of the tools is last year, Canada joined 50 other countries in adopting updates to the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises on responsible business conduct. So these are really comprehensive. They're some of the most comprehensive and widely endorsed principles for responsible business conduct. And they help for Canada to define what our expectations are of Canadian companies for their international activities, which of course then is aligned with our responsible business conduct strategy. And in those guidelines, they do have critical changes that reflect this evolving expectation for businesses in the increasingly tech-driven and digital world. They have clear recommendations for enterprises to carry out risk-based due diligence into relation, in relation to the development, sale, and use of technology, and to adopt responsible data governance practices. But to 
to be effective, as we know, uh, they actually, they do require transparency and accountability. So absent of the robust work of civil society, uh, it's difficult to know whether organizations are living up to their promises. And I would say organizations and governments. We all know that civil society is a key part of holding the entire ecosystem accountable. Um, and that is why we have been providing support to the World Benchmark Alliance and particularly the Digital Inclusion Benchmark funding, providing that funding, because I think it was Lauren or Yen, I'm not sure, but it's just the, the importance of the data to drive the conversation based on data so that there's a starting point and you can have, you're speaking the same language when you're having the conversation and pushing for those uh, commitments. Um, so I think with that, I just, I wanted to share those reflections in the sense that that ecosystem is being strengthened. I think we're moving, we've seen that. Um, it must be the multi-stakeholder, but I think the multi-stakeholder, I think we all are sort of learning a bit more, if I may say, into what are the capabilities and what are the responsibilities of the different stakeholders and how will we hold each other accountable? And we have to continue to learn each other's languages and the way of operation and, and work together. So perhaps with that, um, I would, I would, well, I'll hand the floor back and I look forward to listening to Eileen. Yeah. Um, maybe, um, uh, Tara, before we move to, to um, Dr. Donahue, it would be great if you could respond um, briefly to, to that question, right? Voluntary measures are not sufficient. Um, and so what role do you think governments can play in really an international, uh, you know, at the international level, securing um, industry follow-up um, and follow through on their commitments to responsible AI and, and also really codify transparency and accountability for those companies? Um, so again, I think the, we have to keep building that ecosystem, right? So the commitments we've seen, as I mentioned, the, the Microsoft uh, initiative that was launched at Munich, we have the declarations. Um, so in, in actually putting those into practice, I do feel that the data, the data we need to be, we have, need to have the same understanding of where we're at. So we're making the commitments. Now let's have the same understanding of where we're at so we can actually have those meaningful conversations. Uh, one of the areas that I'd like to see strengthen is because we do have very different languages and we operate in different spheres. So when we have co uh, company commitments and we have government commitments and some of them uh, you know, have voluntary across the two, how do we bring those worlds closer together so that we can actually have... Um, more clear, like we're, we're, we're saying the same thing and we are actually going to hold each other accountable. Um, I still feel that the ecosystem is there and we're building it as fast as we can, but I, I, I'd like to see how we can bring the, the government and the company sector together. Um, and that's uh, again, where I feel the data is. The other part um, I want to explore further is the multi-stakeholder. That's at the core. Canada has always supported multi-stakeholder, but I also feel that we need to push ourselves to say, what does that truly look like? And what are the innovative ways that that can appear, right? So there's, so I can take for our G7 presidency before, uh, as an example, we want to engage and get input as we move into that. What are the ideas? Where are the opportunities? But I think we have to really think about what does um, engagement look like? Often people say, well, can you pay for participation in international events? That's one, I absolutely hear that. But what are the other ways that we can actually have meaningful voices? How can we reach out? How can we build our own ecosystem into the policy development process? I think that's an area that, that could be improved. Um, and of course there is the funding that is, uh, that is there. And of course the support for the, the data research uh, that's underway. Um, but I want to I want to keep building those tools. We're in a fiscally constrained environment. I think everybody's feeling that. So it's going to be the creativity of how do we reinforce the networks that we have, and actually, what does meaningful engagement look like? I I would have an interpretation of what meaningful means for me, but everybody will have a different perspective. And I think we just have to get better at understanding what it means for other actors, and then trying to build that into our planning. Great. Um, thank you so much, Tara. Um, why don't we um, move on to Eileen um, uh, so that she can share her perspective um, from, from, her, uh, from her lived experience. 
Well, first off, thank you so much for inviting me. And I really want to congratulate the World Benchmarking Alliance and also Jan Rizdak for leading this valuable work and just say congratulations about where you are in the process. I think you've made an incredible contribution. So I was asked to speak about the potential impacts of AI on elections, democracy, and human rights. And I think as a starting place, it's really important to recognize that AI has the potential to turbocharge whatever it's applied to, whatever purpose, whether the aim is beneficial or malign, by making it faster, cheaper, have bigger potential to scale, and, and at the same time, even more effectively targeted. Um, so this is not just dual use technology in the traditional sense, it's omni use and general purpose at this point. On the positive side of the equation, AI obviously could support democracy by enabling greater transparency, enhancing civic engagement and participation, improving access to information or to government services, and basically enabling the exercise of human rights. And if we're serious about inclusion in the benefits of AI, AI could help close all kinds of digital divides and be an accelerant to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals and help solve some of the world's most intractable problems related to poverty or disease or climate change. So that's the positive side. But as you all know too well, AI can also be used for repression, to strengthen authoritarian control of the information realm, can be used for unlawful surveillance, and to undermine privacy, free expression, and assembly and association. Addressing the implications of AI will be the ultimate whole of society, multi-stakeholder global challenge. This is an inherently global challenge because it will increasingly impact every dimension of people's daily lives, wherever they live, wherever they are in this growing AI ecosystem. And over the past year, I'm sure you are all well aware the international AI governance conversation and number of initiatives have exploded. It's an incredibly unwieldy conversation. There are many different sets of principles, risk management frameworks put forth for with slightly different angles and focal points. But there are some signs of convergence around core values and concerted efforts to ensure that AI is developed, deployed, and governed in accordance with universal human rights, the rule of law, appropriate legal authorizations, safeguards, and oversight. And the goal is that AI is governed in such a way that it does not undermine democracy, but actually supports it and supports the exercise of civil liberties and human rights. In this context, I will mention uh, that values-based AI governance is being prioritized by the US government as evidenced by the um, executive order on safe, secure, trustworthy development and use of AI from October, 2023, where the president set out a comprehensive whole of government strategy to ensure that safe rights respecting AI is adopted, deployed, and used for the benefit of all citizens at home and the benefit of people everywhere. We, we're well aware this is um, important that we focus on citizens at home, but we are deeply intertwined with what happens in the world at large. Turning to the more specific question about potential impact of AI on elections, Needless to say, 2024 will be an extremely consequential election year, as has already been mentioned. We all we see different numbers. We have the number of countries voting at over 70 and the number of people at over, you said 2 billion, you can say 4 billion. I think it's depending on if you count only adult population or the population as a whole that's covered. But many people are voting in many places around the world this year. And from our vantage point or from my vantage point, the most pressing concern related to AI in the context of elections is the risk that the information realm could be flooded with GAI enabled, uh, created, GAI created content that's intentionally misleading 
or polarizing, which in turn could dampen citizen willingness to vote or undermine trust in the election outcomes themselves. Even before development and proliferation of GAI, generative AI, more mundane, regular AI-enabled tools were already being used to manipulate the digital information realm and to shape and spread narratives and memes on social media, to create synthetic images, audio, and even uh, less sophisticated deep fake videos. GAI will exacerbate this pre-existing condition by making it much easier to create content that's even more convincingly misleading and making those tools much more widely available. GAI will also enable much more efficient micro-targeting to drive polarization and target marginalized communities, which could cause them to retreat from civic life. So on a positive note, some companies and civil society groups are developing new debunking tools, debunking tools to address GAI enabled influence campaigns. But even if debunked after the fact, misleading election relating content that has already been released may have already had the effect of muddying public discourse and eroding public confidence in the integrity of democratic processes. Generative AI could also enable cyber intrusions into infrastructure for the administration of elections, giving malicious actors unauthorized access. Again, even if these cyber intrusions are mitigated before any systems are actually manipulated or damaged, the fact of the intrusion or the allegation of the intrusion itself can undermine public confidence in the integrity of election outcomes. So the bottom line is GAI could dramatically exacerbate existing challenges related to the erosion of integrity in the information realm and trust in elections. And this is a big deal. So how do we address this challenge? But as already has been said, by recognizing this is urgent, it's a whole of society challenge that will require whole of society, multi-stakeholder solutions. I do want to here underscore the importance of the global declaration for, on information integrity led by Canada and the Netherlands. That was a very important articulation of the challenge and sort of galvanizing the international government community into action. I will also mention the U.S. is co-chairing an initiative at the OECD. Um, it's called the Dismiss Hub, where we are working with the 38 OECD members. Um, and it's actually open to non-OECD members to develop practical solutions to addressing the erosion of integrity in the information realm without undermining freedom of expression. But I will also note the private sector obviously has a very increasingly critical role to play here. And it starts with implementation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights at every stage of the design, development, and deployment of AI tools. Perhaps most importantly though, the private sector, civil society, and all stakeholders need to focus on building civic resilience to AI-enabled manipulation. We've talked about building civic resilience for many years. This is the moment we really need to get serious about it. And obviously that will include much more enhanced transparency. That will be key to this building resilience by developing and making tools available for users and citizens to easily recognize AI generated content, educating platform users and the general public about how the information realm is being manipulated and social platforms can be influenced. On the positive side, there is some evidence that GAI-enabled detection tools can play a significant role in helping us keep pace with malign efforts to spread misleading information and narratives. So investment in the development of GAI-enabled detection tools really should be prioritized. So this is a pivotal moment 
It's important that these challenges get elevated, all stakeholders get more serious about mitigating the risk of AI, and we build civic resilience to AI-enabled information manipulation. And I just applaud the work of the World Benchmarking Alliance and all of you for embracing this opportunity to make such a difference on this urgent challenge. And thank you for including me. Yeah, thank you so much for um, giving us a glimmer of hope, I would say. Um, so maybe the question would be, how, you know, what is your level of optimism or pessimism? Um, and, and, and what gives you confidence that collectively we can actually um, mitigate um, and avoid the most serious consequences, especially in such a, um, a, a year of, of, of such wide, widespread you know, uh, election cycle? So this is a question that I find comes up uh, quietly with my friends and for the people in the community I've been working in for a long time. Those of us who have held on to the, the basic idea that technology can be a force for the for good and for to enable all the things I care about and we care about, uh, while recognizing we've always had challenges we've had to address and mitigate, but this is a sort of a moment of truth where the question is, can we remain optimistic in the face of such rapid innovation that is really outstripping the capacity of governing actors in whatever sectors they sit to keep pace in governance innovation that matches the innovation with the technology? And um, here I would say the interesting upside or silver lining of the public release of ChatGPT and these other GAI enabled tools is that it really has gotten the public's attention in a whole new way and gotten the attention certainly of governments. And I think it has elevated the sense of responsibility in the private sector, hopefully, but, but there is new openness in the private sector to engaging even in a regulation con conversation or really understanding that the, the responsibilities they have are to the societies in which they are operating. And um, I just feel like there's more seriousness given the urgency of the types of problems we've been talking about. I don't think um, any, any entity that has had the blessing and good luck to be able to be working and operating in an open democratic society wants that opportunity of open democratic rule of law based societies to be eroded through the use of this through the malign use of these technologies and it's really the responsibility of everybody to um, make sure that's not the case and then I will just let, last add this. We've been talking about multi-stakeholder governance um, for a long time in the technology governance realm. And again, this is the moment for multi-stakeholder engagement and um, governance, in fact, to be elevated and taken more seriously. So my optimism, my continuing optimism is based on the sense of urgency, and um, more genuine concern about the responsibility to address these problems together. Thank you so much, Tara and Eileen. In many ways, the efforts that you're undertaking are really defining a new social license to operate in the virtual world, um, if you think about it in a, in, 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 in a different way. Um, so uh, thank you so much. And uh, I, I believe um, you might you might have to um, uh, drop off, but we're we're so grateful for you setting the stage really for a really really robust uh, uh, discussion. And and uh, we're going to be coming back to you on some of your suggestions and some of Tara's suggestions as well. Thank you. I think we're going to um, turn uh, to actually a discussion um, from some of uh, some of uh, the investors in civil society. Uh, we're going to first start with um, Caitlin uh, Kraft um, Buckman, the CEO founder at Women at the Table. Um, and Caitlin, I want to um, ask um, from your perspective, you know, what do you envision the civil society role here um, during phase two? And, and where do you think um, that interaction between uh, 
uh, civil society investors and, and others in the ecosystem we've talked about can contribute to a whole ecosystem or, or a holistic approach um, to what we need to do. Um, thanks. Thank you for the question. I've got to say, and I'm so happy to be here with a, actually a very unique assembly of, of, of actors who are trying to sort of create, sort of course correct what um, the path that we're on together. And I love, I love lots that's been said, including your social license to operate in a virtual world. I think that's beautiful. And I love the mentioning from our two government um, colleagues about whole of society approaches and multi-stakeholder approaches, because from a civil society perspective, which too often, by the way, in these environments, mean tech companies and not classical um, civil society activist groups, um, such as ours, um, we need everybody sitting around. We need a whole of society conversation about the, what the world is that we want to live in and really define these values that we hold so dear and to be proactive. So we have uh, had a lot of talk about the guardrails that are critical, but I think we also need to have conversations about the proactive um, assistive technology, right? So it's not, it's not reductive. It's not about replacing humans. It's not about only creating value and efficiency um, without human dignity. <laughs> and it's really, how do we use this technology that, that so we can augment and assist? And I, and I think that, that we need to, to have that conversation focused on really on impact. And in order to talk about the impact, to be able to look at ex ante as well as post facto impact assessments, and I'm very, very happy with this declaration that we've all jointly um, authored and have put out into the world that we're really talking about impact assessments. And I even believe the word human rights and human rights-based approaches have been sort of are there because we really need to think about uh, human dignity. Now, why are we in this coalition? We believe deeply, of course, that civil society, the communities affected, citizens, need to be part of the conversation in a, in a profound way. But also this idea, um, certainly in late capitalism, that investors have the levers, um, not only the responsibility, as you all have obviously shown, but really, really the levers to sort of course correct and to change and to make this something that really creates value in all of the ways that we, you know, we, we measure value in our society. So um, that's what we're interested in doing and working together with you to accomplish that. So thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to you um, at the end for our comments. Um, I want to also introduce um, uh, Professor Emma Rekomp Re Bloom. I'm terrible at pronunciation, so I apologize. I tried my best. Um, but really, I'm um, having um, a, 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 an academic perspective. Um, you're a professor at the University of Pretoria and a member of the UN Secretary General AI Advisory um, body. Um, so from your perspective, um, in terms of you know, looking at the regional and, and global developments around AI regulation um, in, in terms of key risks um, and associated with development. What 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 do you think um, we we need to do? What do you think this kick needs to focus on um, to ensure, for example, there, there there's an inclusion um, and, and that we're actually it's a, aspiring to um, uh, you know a human rights sort of centric approach um, um, uh, and uh, that companies take. So what what would you say that investors should be asking of companies? Um, and uh, who else should we be listening to? Thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be here and to be a part of this um, very important and unique um, in many ways. Um, endeavor of the World Benchmarking Alliance. And thank you so much, Jan and Nicholas, for allowing me back in, kind of, because I've been absent for a while. Um, so I want to, you know, I want to talk to you about, to answer your question from the perspective of the, of the intergovernmental kind of approach and a global approach to how we affect um, mutual accountability um, and this whole idea of a whole of society approach, um, because you know, in the end, it isn't the private sector on its own 
member states, UN member states on their own, tech companies on their own, at civil society, you know, just ordinary people making use of some kind of generative AI app or whatever the case might be. All of us are in interconnected in some way. Um, and I, the, my main message is that we need to understand this concretely, what it means to be interconnected with each other. So on the one hand, just quickly in terms of the current atmosphere, in terms of global regulation, um, yes, in fact, um, maybe to some extent, um, you know, open AI, um, you know, I don't know if one can say this on this forum, but it's cutting their noses to spite their faces because they have managed with ChatGPT to wake up the world to how urgent all of these risks are. And at the same time, to show us the wonder of this very beautiful technology that we are talking about. Um, so worldwide, I think, you know, people are from civil society upwards Everybody is aware of this in a, in a different way, but more aware than, than before. Um, so the, the one or the first most important global regulation that we have at the moment is the UNESCO recommendation on the ethics of AI. And I must say, you know, yes, 193 member states signed in 2021 um, or um, adopted it in 2021. And when the US joined UNESCO again, they also adopted it. Um, but what is more important is that over 80 member states have already incorporated it into their national strategies. And with the um, readiness assessment methodology, which is first of its kind, and I'll say a little bit in one minute later, and why this is so important, um, this is a methodology that helps member states assess where they are in terms of being able to implement the recommendation. So meeting member states where they are with what they need or giving them what they need with what they have. So this is a, a tool that measures one's uh, member state's readiness over a range of dimensions, um, technological, economic, educational, regulatory, societal, cultural, infrastructural, and so on. Um, and this, in fact, 33 um, countries on the African continent, a continent has already completed their readiness assessment methodologies. But this is not something only for the global south. This is, in fact, a methodology that is intended for all member states. And this comes back to what I said about interconnectedness, but I'll I'll close the loop in a, in, in a little bit. As far as other global endeavors go, if we think specifically now of, of the Secretary General's um, AI advisory body, um, there is this feeling that there we need some kind of global international governance of AI technology. And many people will say, well, why do we need this? At the um, uh, Global Forum on A AI Ethics in Slovenia earlier this month, you know, people were saying, well, you know, we already have data sharing agreements um, with each other, you know, different member states. So why is it that, why do we need this oversight? Well, we need it, I'll give you a few reasons, there are many. Um, geostrategic tensions over access to compute, data and talent ensures an unequal spread of benefits and risks. And this, is a place where the private sector has a really important role to play. Um, then secondly, we have to try, we have to find ways to harness AI for the good of all, but also to help us meet the, the SDGs. And there is this kind of global governance deficit in the sense that we need a way to ensure that current regulations are interoperable and that we find alignment um, with different norms in some way so that we can build a global framework uh, for, for governance and accountability, accountability being the most important. And then also, I mean, of course, AI affects humankind, you know, in all its layers and every single person is in harm's way if we don't take some kind of action. 
The transboundary nature of AI systems obviously means that there needs to be some kind of global oversight because it's it's we're dealing with transnational companies, as everybody knows, and we need to ensure, as I said before, the benefits are shared and sustainable. But now, why are these? And okay, and there's many new regional examples. The AI Act, as we all know, has finally come into being, or almost final sign off in June. Um, and then, you know, there's the big implementation phase. Um, we have the um, executive order um, in the United States in October last year. We have the African Union who has just today um, made available the um, plans for an African continental wide AI strategy, which I'm very excited about. Actually, as we talk, their event is taking place. Um, but why are these why are these things necessary? And just in one minute, because I think my time is up. I see many people talking about they sit, um, you know, at various events, and people say it's so important that we should not leave anyone behind. And then people kind of, depending on who's speaking, you can see that you know, in some cases, wow, people are kind of very glad that they are, they will definitely not be the ones that will be left behind. And I will say to you that everybody is going to be left behind if we don't stand together. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter who you are. Um, we have to stand together. Um, and what became very clear from conversations in Slovenia at the Global Forum was that it is not just to ensure an equitable spread of access to data, to compute and to talent. It is also important to work on enabling as many member states as possible and as many private sector companies and startups and um, SMEs to design and develop their own AI technology. It's not just about sharing in the products that already exist. It's about enabling the entire world to, to harness this technology for their own good, where they are. Then it is very important to have an alternative discourse to that of big tech. Um, so it is important to have some kind of global regulatory conversation that whole of society take part in so that there is a counter to the hype that we get from some of the big tech companies. Um, and in fact, the global regulation might be still for a long time to come, the only protection that many people in various corners of the world will have. And we have a responsibility. Will all of this be strong enough? So the AI Act proof will be in the implementation pudding. But a last word, I think it is really important to understand that and we also say that in our fifth principle in the in the interim report of the UN body, we everything should be anchored in international law, in the rule of law, human rights law standards and principles, everything that we do in terms of AI governance. But the world is structured in terms of individu individual sovereign states. So we need to ensure that every individual state has the ability to develop their own AI strategy so that they can ensure that there is also accountability from the private sector and a kind of two-way conversation. It has to be cascaded down in some way. Yeah. Thank you. No, Emma, yeah, Emma, I really appreciate that perspective, especially um, the counter, um, the countermeasures to enable um, everyone to have access and to develop their own um, AI strategies and own AI technology. Um, we're going to move on um, to, to listen to um, now investor perspective, um, which I'm really excited. Um, and then at the end, um, I hope we'll still have time. We're running a little bit behind um, to have at least one uh, key comment from from all the panelists. Um, I'm going to hand it over um, now to, to Patrick Short. Um, he's been my um, partner in, not crime, but partner, my, my, my partner um, in phase one, uh, which has been super exciting. He's a, um, he is a sustainability investing um, graduate associate at Fidelity International. Um, you know, you have been uh, co-leading this initiative um, uh, with us since 2022. Um, what can you share with us in terms of key learnings from these engagements um, to sort of inspire the, the real progress we saw in phase, 
phase one? Um, and what do we need to do going forward to ensure that this continues to be an effect, uh, effective um, uh, coalition? Yeah, um, thanks, Lauren. And I guess before I start, I just think it's worth saying um, thank you again to our speakers. I think it's no mean feat following them and their insights. So hopefully we can make up some time here by sharing some, I guess, three quick learning um, learnings and observations from, I guess, our two years working together on, on this um, important initiative. I think, I guess, the main one and the thing we should be most positive about is that from, from our experience, companies do want to talk about the issues of ethical AI. And from our view, the collective voice is powerful, the need to stand together, collective impact, that's, that's something as from an investor side, we've all got behind. Um, so I think pulling out some of the, the reflections from the progress reports really interesting. Of the 44 companies we, we tried to engage with last year, um, I think two thirds or a significant majority of those companies were both open to talking and receptive to, to our asks, which is, I think, fundamentally encouraging for, for the year ahead. Um, 19 of those companies that had been targeted um, for outreach from the kick. Um, subsequently received credit under the digital inclusion benchmark for announcing public um, a public set of ethical AI principles. So, without overplaying our role in that, I think it, I think it's clear to see that investor asks are being um, implemented into future disclosure. So, ultimately, that's that's what we're seeking to achieve here. Um, in terms of traction, I think if you look at the the companies we've been engaging with under the kick. It's a real global mix and, frankly, some of the, the biggest players in the field. So I think we should all be really happy that the engagement teams, I guess the nature of the kick itself, is providing that, that access to these, these really important decision makers. Um, and that should remain front of mind. I guess the second key learning, and this is something I've grappled with over the past year, is I guess the obligation on all of us to keep learning. So this is this is a space that has grown ridiculously fast. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the facts that we've rehashed earlier, but I think it's taken all of us by surprise just, just how quick the speed of development of some of these technologies. I think that's, I guess, reflected in investor demands, commercial development of new tools, regulatory pressure these conversations are all moving um, at a pace that means what we were doing back in 2022, it's no longer enough, hence the need to, to evolve our asks. Um, in terms of what that means in practice, I think it means having the right people on these calls. So not, not just from the company side, whether they've got the accountable executives, I think it's ensuring we as investors, um, civil society, we have the right people asking the right questions. And so ultimately we, we drive those outcomes that we're all trying to achieve. Um, I guess when we think about those, the, the learning, the skills, the upskilling, we, we still need to remain, I guess, guided by the principles um, that I guess led to the evolution of this kick, um, ensuring companies are doing the right thing in the digital world. And as long as we stay kind of guided by those principles, I think, we won't go too far wrong. So I guess why the kick? It's data. I think data will become increasingly important. And so it's not just the relationships we have as um, investors, civil society. Um, we have a good set of data there provided by the WBA um, to support really effective engagement. And I guess the most important part is that I genuinely believe these risks and opportunities are inherently interlinked. I don't think it's credible that you can have a company producing solutions across this um, this value chain that doesn't have um, the right checks and balances in place to to drive, I guess, just outcomes for I guess the everyday person. I think the regulatory pressures there. I think the direction of travel is clearly only going one way, and so we we often talk about risks, opportunities as if they're somewhat separate. But I think the companies that do the best on risk management will ultimately um, stand to benefit in the long term. So I guess what, what this means for us as Fidelity, that means continuation of 
effective engagement um, with those companies where we deem it a material risk and and also look to explore other opportunities to to build those relationships with the companies um, to drive change and drive best practice in this space but we're really excited about the prospect of phase two and um, I look forward to working with a lot of you over the year ahead but Lauren I'll hand back to you. Thanks so much, Patrick. And obviously, we, we can't forget about impact, right? Both positive and negative impact. And I think that's why civil society voice at the table is also important for us to, to um, enhance our understanding of the whole society impact, both positive and negative. Um, I'm going to move um, to uh, one of the highest risk uses of, um, of uh, AI, which is uh, facial recognition technology. And so I'm really delighted um, to have Benjamin uh, Shekrun, uh, lead uh, stewardship analyst uh, for proxy voting and engagement at Candrium. They're based in France. Um, uh, uh, bienvenue, uh, Benjamin. Um, could you uh, share with us um, why um, uh, Cadrium, in particular, decided to take on the fight of the of the highest uh, highest um, the hardest uh, I think um, FRT um, uh, uh, use case to to engage on. Um, and, uh, you know, what uh, drove you as Cadrium and your group to join uh, forces with the uh, with the WBA um, ethical AI kick? OK, yeah. Hi. Hi, everybody. Really excited to be uh, part of this uh, launch event. Very exciting. Um, yeah. So why um, wh why should we join forces? Um, so just a bit of history over the last three years, there's been about uh, 20 uh, active responsible investors that have been engaging companies on, on um, ethical facial recognition. And these dialogues have led us to gain a lot of insights into how these companies operate, uh, their processes, their governance, and to define best practice. And um, as Jan said earlier on, facial recognition is, is uh, you know, obviously one of the high risk use cases of AI. Sorry, the, do the dog's going bananas. Um, sorry, give me a second. Sorry, <laughs> um, apologies. So we feel it makes a lot of sense to integrate this work, uh, this experience into the WBA's um, ethical AI um, kick as it's moving into practices and operations. Um, also, it's a time when we're seeing um, a growing number of uh, initiatives around technology and digital rights and, and human rights. So we believe it makes a lot of sense to regroup and to um, integrate um, this group of uh, on, on facial recognition into the Ethical AI Coalition. Uh, this is a large coalition. There's some, there's some brilliant names on the statement already. There's some great people that I've worked with already um, on this call today, uh, highly recognized in the, uh, in, the, in the industry of responsible finance. Um, I think we, you know, we, we love the fact that this coalition has the backing of the WBA that has allocated some serious resources. Uh, the digital inclusion benchmark is great. 200, 200 companies that are that are being uh, um, uh, uh, analyzed, and um, and you know we we do um, you know like to think that all this data is very important. We integrate it certainly into all our um, ESG analysis. And um, I, I want to close my 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 comments with um, something that um, that Patrick uh, that uh, yeah Patrick just said about you know we're, we're all learning. I think it's really important that we learn that this group learns, because the way I see things going forward is that we have to bring expertise. Um, I think the first phase was super interesting and in asking companies to to you know to to, to have. Um, public disclosure of principles and governance, but we're going, we're going into operations now. We're going to have to drill down. We're going to have to bring some of the best practice uh, that we see out there. Um, we're going to have to bring this expertise, and that's you know the importance of having um, NGOs and academia you know with us in this coalition is really important because I think you know that's you know asking companies just to have ethical AI is not going to cut it. We're going to have to you know bring a lot of added value. Uh, and I do think, you know, I think Tara uh, earlier on said, said, you know, what is the, you know, meaningful engagement? What does meaningful engagement look like? I think this is what it looks like. This is, you know, it's really bringing something to the table that companies can, you know, so we can have a constructive dialogue. So I'll leave it. Um, I'll leave it there.
No, that's great. And just to say, I mean, uh, you know, I've 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 engaged with uh, with Ben's group, and uh, I think the most successful engagement models we've had in the previous kick were really peer comparison with data, right? Peer comparison on practice, uh, but really digging into AI governance and implementation at the product and service level. I think some of those. Um, some some of those were and bringing resources um, and this idea that the kick um, has a philosophy I think of continued learning um, and bringing other perspective in I think is going to be super important right Jan in the next phase I want to move on to Michaela uh, Gregory who's the director of ESG services um, for NEI investments based in Canada um, NEI itself has uh, has been uh, very involved in multiple technology di digital human rights uh, initiatives and I've also part Partnered with Michaela, and she's a really great partner um, in engagement. Um, so I wanted um, her to bring actually her perspective of um, her involvement in these multiple initiatives and what challenges do investors encounter in engaging with companies on ethical AI and what are the best ways really to strengthen coordination across these, in, uh, these initiatives, including um, some of the ones uh, like ranking digital rights um, that we've previously highlighted. Yeah, no, happy to um, dive in into those questions, Lauren. Thanks for having me um, to the WBA team as well. And uh, I think a good place for me to start off is essentially where Ben left off and where you added some additional context, Lauren, as well. Patrick has also commented. I think one of the challenges that investors face is just how rapidly this space is moving and what it means to stay up to speed on in terms of industry action, what industry is up to in terms of regulatory changes, we need to stay informed. And I think that is one of the significant benefits of being involved in initiatives like this cake in terms of giving us that space, that forum um, to, to really be able to connect with other stakeholders, to bolster our knowledge, to make sure that we are developing our own expertise by speaking with those who are very near and close to the issues, um, increasing our access to data that we can use to really make meaningful asks and set meaningful expectations in our dialogues with companies. Um, so that I think is one of those big challenges that I think will shape how we approach engagement moving forward, but I, I feel pretty good about the fact that we do have spaces like these to help us with that exact challenge. Um, another one I think of course is just given the attention um, that industry has been receiving on ethical AI and digital rights issues broadly, um, there is a lot of interest from investors and other stakeholders and rightfully so. Um, but I think what that does mean is that we have to forge a way and an approach that allows us to actually move forward with meaningful engagement with companies that have very different responses and approaches to actually having um, dialogues with shareholders and stakeholders broadly. Um, and so it, it requires a certain amount of nimbleness and adaptability um, some companies may really want to have a dialogue with a large group of investors. They may find it efficient and effective. Others, given sensitivities, may want to lean in with initial discourse with leads and co-leads um, and then look to, to sharing more broadly. And that also provides those leads and co-leads with the opportunity to then um, information that all investors will need to make their own decisions internally. Um, so how do we strengthen coordination across these initiatives? I think that is a, a very big question. Um, but given time, I would say that from my perspective, there's consideration of how we think about this substantively and operationally, right? So substantively, there is the question of what messages are we reinforcing? <laughs> um, what kinds of information are we um, clear around that, that we need or understanding of even impact, impact assessments that um, I, I believe Caitlin mentioned earlier as well? Um, 
how do we ensure that we're where we where there is some alignment that we are expressing that alignment substantively, um, recognizing of course that we will have our differences internally, even within the initiatives on how we want to see specific companies move forward on certain issues. And then I think operationally, there is the idea of how do we um, ensure that we're not duplicating our efforts? How do we ensure that there is, um, that we're learning and sharing that we are that we are coordinating as possible to minimize that potential engagement fatigue um, and to maximize the amount of information um, and transparency that we can encourage companies to provide with investors broadly as well. So I'll stop there and really keen to hear others' comments and questions. Thanks so much, Michaela. Um, um... You were last but not least, definitely. Um, nice, nice way to wrap it up. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, and if there are no questions, I might move to um, a panelist for one sort of final uh, thing they would hope we would focus on, or one thing we need to focus on this year. Um, but let's let's open it up um, uh, for for some questions if there are any. Um, ben and Nicholas, um, I haven't really been following the chat, so if if anyone does see questions, um, could you raise your hand? Um, and uh, let's see if we we have a show of hands. There's so many people on, I just wanna make sure we don't miss anyone. So feel free to unmute um, if you'd like to ask um, any of the panelists a question or just ask a question in general about where we're, what our next steps are. Nicholas or Jan, do you see any questions in the audience? No? Okay. Hi. Hi. Sorry. Uh, this is Julia Shatikova speaking. Um, I just want to ask, um, you know, exactly about next next steps, Lauren. Um, when uh, do you think uh, we will be able to see the allocation of uh, new companies that were added to the initial list, and whether there yeah. will be a potential to discuss that? So, what what's the format of that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this might go into more logistics than this audience, um, uh, uh, you know, wants to hear. But just to say that we will be sharing um, company allocations for those who have signed up. Um, uh, we're working on that, uh, finalizing that allocation in the next week or so. Um, and we'll be sending those out before the end of March or by the end of March. Um, and we are requesting that all leads and co-leads um, initiate new outreach um, by the end of April. Um, so really uh, formal um, active engagement starting um, in the beginning of uh, Q2. Excellent. Thank you very much. I think this is something that we have all been looking forward to. And uh, you still have a little bit of time also to provide feedback um, if for whatever reason you you have new interest in new companies. Um, there are 200 companies. There is plenty to go around. Um, so uh, we're really happy about that as well. I think there's opportunities for all investors to engage, um, at least in uh, one uh, engagement they would like. That's good to know. Thank you. Great. Any other um, questions? Um, uh, any other show of hands? Yeah. Great. Um, rather than me doing closing remarks, I would love to hear one, uh, one, one thing from each panelist that you would hope we would accomplish in the next 12 months through this KIC initiative. Patrick, I'm going to start with you. Mine's going to be a, a boring operational one, um, but I, I think we're all driven by outcomes. I, I think underpinning our involvement in this kick is a belief that this is the best way to, to drive impact and drive outcomes. So I, I think focusing on clear, measurable objectives in um, our dialogue with these companies um, and essentially being able to sit here in a year's time and, I guess, look back proudly on um, whether it's 
I guess, the publication of new principles for companies we'd consider laggards or whether it's a, a new report with a signaling a, a human rights impact assessment um, at a company we, we deem to be a, a current leader. So I think demonstrating outcomes of, of this initiative will be a successful year for me. Wonderful, very practical. Ben. Yes, for, I think for me, it's it's really going to to achieve this um, collaboration with um, um, civil society. I think we, it's it's really needed. Um, it, I haven't seen it in other you know large um, initiatives, and I think that if we can if we can really get that going, uh, it would be a great um, it would be a great achievement if we can get onto companies. With, with this expertise I was going on about earlier on that comes from you know a bit of academia a bit, bit of you know NGOs um that would be that would be really good and be you know have some some effective dialogues there yeah I'm looking forward to that no that's great Caitlin I'm gonna go to you only because uh of the civil society aspect and and how do you think you can help investors and help us um and and what you you would hope um that uh, women at the table and CSO voices um could it could could uh, help leverage our, our our what what I think could be extraordinary is that if we worked together because it would have to take a, a joint effort with academia with civil society with investors to actually create impact assessment no more principles we have so many principles but if we have something that's really tangible really measurable everybody wants data everybody wants to see and something that we would agree on I think that could be quite extraordinary um so. I look forward to impact it. assessment done right. That's 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 beautiful. Um, uh, Michaela. Uh, yes, I mean, I think those were some strong points. Um, but I think in addition to that, then I would like for us to be able to hopefully um, advance some dialogues that potentially had less traction in the first phase. Um, I think things have been shifting. The landscape has been changing. And it would be a phenomenal outcome, I think, for me, if we were able to really get more companies involved in meaningful dialogues, particularly as we really seek to build out our asks in collaboration with um, civil society as well. No, that's great. Um, uh, Emma. I think building out the, the, the kick more, making it more, um, more visible, it's very visible already, but make it more visible, um, ensuring that civil society um, uh, is a part of this. And so that we have an AI ecosystem where it becomes commonplace to hold each other accountable, show that the private sector is invested in um, ensuring that this technology is um, designed and developed and deployed and used to the for the benefit of everybody you know, just illustrate it more clearly. Um, yeah, because this is this is this is probably, you know, this is such an important um moment for us in um in getting into maintaining the private sector and civil society into into this, you know, this whole endeavor of trying to to harness AI for good. But I yeah, I think just being more concrete, the the impact assessments sharing it more widely, showing people how, how invested we are and getting more companies on board. Yeah, I was really happy to see government also, um, you know, being at the table today. And so my desire would be to see more alignment between government efforts and private sector expectations. And how can we as investors reinforce that message, I think would be really important um, in identifying really a social license to operate um, in the virtual world um, with with, with um, specific objectives um, that we've that we've outlined. Jan um, or Nicholas, um, we have 30 seconds. What would you or actually we might be overdue. What would you hope um, from a WBA perspective um, that this kick achieves in the, in the next 12 months? And then and then I think we'll have to end. I think we are indeed 30 seconds over over, over time. But uh, I, I think uh, in a we are very hopeful that you know, with all these changes to to the kick and updates and how we we conduct the the campaign, um, that all of it comes together, right? We have various uh, sort of levels of uh, granularity that are coming together and converging, 
um, with the facial recognition initiative joining uh, and us continuing to, to sort of feed uh, data into the kick. Um, there's so much more to explore. Uh, and uh, and I, one thing I think we're all looking forward to is sort of bringing all of the uh, the data that comes of the uh, of the initiative to the public so that it's useful not just to the members of the campaign, uh, but also to uh, to sort of inspire other uh, initiatives and other individuals working on very similar issues. It's a, it's a very broad alliance and we're happy to strengthen it from inside and outside at the same time. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Um, thanks to all our speakers. And uh, we look forward to um, getting on with the work.